I feel a real privilege to be part of that legacy. Um, you know, he's not really part of mine. I guess he is, but like, I'm really honored to be part of his and to be part of that legacy and to be like asked uh, when people want to talk about that's That's why when people, you know, who are doing podcasts and, and our Muppet fans like want to talk about Muppets, I'm like, absolutely. Let me make sure I get you the information on this because this is a big deal. And I know I've got that info. So, um, so, you know, it's a real responsibility. I feel it's a great responsibility. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger and Cameron Garrity. And today on the show, we have the wonderful Brian J. Jones. Welcome to the show, Brian. Hey, good afternoon, guys, or good morning, wherever we all may be coming from. <laughs> uh, it's so, so good to have you here. For those who don't know, Brian J. Jones is an author and biographer who's done incredible work covering the lives of, of George Lucas, uh, Washington Irving, uh, Dr. Seuss, and of course, Jim Henson, and in doing so, has kind of become an ambassador to our puppetry community. And uh, we're so excited to have him here and, and talk about all this stuff. Brian J. Jones, welcome to Puppet Tears. Thank you, guys. And and it's it's a it's actually a, a very nice view, and it's an honor to be considered an ambassador of the puppetry community. I am not a puppeteer, even though you can see I have like the old sock puppet dot <laughs> socks dot pup, pets dot com sock puppet. Um, I'm not a great puppeteer, but uh, I really admire the artistry and uh, and I and I try, but that's about the extent of it. Yeah, but you gave us one of our one of our most valuable tools is this uh, biography of Jim Henson. But before we get too much into that, I want to talk a little bit more about you. And is there anything you're working on right now that you can talk about? I am not. Um, this is the first time since 2006, I think, that I haven't known what my next project's going to be. Um, I got done with the Dr. Seuss biography in you know 2019, and I was like, that's it for a while. I'm going to take a break. Well, that lasted about you know three weeks. Um, at which point you started looking for another subject. But um, the biggest issue that I tend to have is I, you know, my subjects, my shelf tends to be sort of iconic names, you know, and iconic names, you know, tend to get done. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to find, you know, some, somebody, have, um, you have to find the right fit between biographer and subject as well, too. But it's, it's kind of hard to find everyone saying, oh, Mr. Rogers, well, as we know, he's been done. You know, uh, David Bowie, he's kind of recently been done. So, you know, it's, there's always, there's always somebody out there that, that would be interesting that I would love to do who's been done. The one I really wanted to do because I'm a huge Beatles nerd and he's actually never been done is Ringo Starr. Um, wow. And I, we made a, we made a run at him and he told us no with peace and love. So, yeah. uh, so no Ringo. Uh, Ringo still has no biography folks, but I tried. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, but can you talk a little bit about that? Cause um, you know, certainly someone like Jim Henson, uh, there, there were books that have come before uh, that you wrote uh, your biography, but it it certainly scratched an itch for for the community that uh, I don't think had been done so before. How do you decide that uh, between what what has been covered and someone who you kind of say like there's not enough, you know, we don't know <clears throat> enough about him. Well, Jim had had never been done um, when I start when I discovered uh, that. I mean, I discovered he hadn't been done. That was why I decided I wanted to do it. He, I um, you know, I finished the biography of Washington Irving. This is about two thousand eight, maybe. And I, I, I've told this a million times, and I always say I wish I had a great story for why I was there. But somehow I had ended up on Jim's Wikipedia page and uh, was reading through it and all the books that they reference. The other thing that's really great about Muppet fans as I've discovered too, is like Muppet fans reference everything, which is pretty cool. Um, so even on the Wikipedia page, Wikipedia is a garbage site for references for the most part, not always, but like Muppet fans reference everything. So everything on Jim's entry was referenced and, but all the books were Jim Henson designs and doodles and the Muppet show book and um, you know, Jim Henson, the imagination and all that stuff. It was all about the work, um, mm. you know, rightly, but there was no real biography of him. I think there'd been a couple of bios for kids maybe, but no real, you know, I'll use the term grown up biography of him, <clears throat> which I thought was, wow, that's really, that's really interesting and a shame. And he'd been dead. So this is, you know, 2008. So he'd been dead 18 years at that point. And I was wondering if maybe there was, you know, Robert Caro or somebody who'd been working on a, you know, somebody who'd been doing research on Jim Henson for 20 years and was working on the project and we just didn't know about it. So I, um, I called my agent and I just, I said, you know, this seems like really low hanging fruit. Why has nobody done Jim? And he, you know, looked to see what had been sold and what was pending and said, you know, there's nothing out here. So so I actually went over to the University of Maryland. At that time, I lived in Montgomery County, Maryland, in this little town called Damascus, which is the next county over from where Jim Henson grew up. It's the next county over from the University of Maryland and from, you know, Hyattsville. And, 
Um, so I, I went over and visited the University of Maryland and talked to the archivist there uh, who oversees the video archive there. For a long time, that was the only place you could find the unexpurgated version of Emmett Otter uh, was, in the, was in the archives there at, at the University of Maryland. And uh, after some conversation with him, I, we talked a little bit about Jim and I asked him why there was no bio of him, just hoping and, you know, to God that he wasn't going to say, well, I've actually been working on a biography of Jim for the last 18 years. <laughs> and, and he wasn't. And he and he said, you know, it's a great it's a great question and um, gave me contact information at the Jim Henson Legacy, which is the organization, as you guys know, that was set up by, you know, Jane Henson and a number of his uh, m m not necessarily the puppeteers. It was more like professional colleagues and business colleagues and some of the family. Um, to, to, you know, really concentrate on Jim and a lot of his work, even beyond the Muppets. And I got in touch with them. And at that time, the head of the legacy was Arthur Novell, who's a lovely, lovely guy who was also Jim's publicist uh, for the last maybe 10 years of his life. So when I started the conversation with Arthur, Arthur really got it. Um, but it still took a long time to, you know, to because there's there was Jane and there were five kids and everybody's, you know, this is this happens in biography. Everybody's got their own their own agenda, and the only things the old thing, you know, they all have their own things they're worried about. So it was, you know, this began this sort of two year conversation with the Hensons about doing this, uh, and you know, because I really wanted to have access. <clears throat> to their private archives. The Henson's, Jim Henson's not like, you know, his papers aren't at the University of Maryland or they're at the, you know, in, in Connecticut where the good puppetry programs are, they're all privately held. So you need to, you have their permission to be in their offices for. So getting their permission was key. And Lisa Henson at one point even said, you know, if we tell you no, are you still gonna go out and try to do this? And I said, you know, I don't think so, because first of all, Jim is not one of these guys. I wrote about George Lucas without his permission, because that cat talks all the time. Like that guy's been on the record, you know, since like 1965. Um, Jim never really did that. You know, I mean, he was well known from the time he was in high school, relatively, but but didn't really ever sit down for interviews. There wasn't a lot there from Jim. So there wasn't a lot to work with. So it was really important to have those archives. And that was what I told her. I said, I don't think I can do this right unless I have those archives. Um, and ultimately what finally happened was after two years of, of conversation and kind of being hot and cold and lukewarm and back, back and forth, I finally put together uh, a sample chapter just so I, could, so I could show them this is the way I would do this. You know, I, that, my, my objective as a biographer is to try to get out of the way. Um, I want Jim to tell it as much as I can. I want Jane to tell it. I want, you know, Frank Oz to tell it. I want to let those voices really do the talking and, and me sort of be the tour guide, but I'm like, I don't want to be in the way. So I went down to the Library of Congress, and the great thing, uh, you know, first of all, it's a Library of Congress, which is amazing. And living there in Maryland, I could just walk, you know, drive down to the Library of Congress. Uh, this is in the days before newspapers.com and all these other amazing archival online sources now. Um, I could go down there, and because he was a local boy, they had a ton of Virginia newspapers and Maryland newspapers down there anyway. So I pulled everything I could find about Jim when he was in high school and college and his early years uh, at Sam and Friends and wrote sort of a, a, a mock-up chapter on that. And I talked a little bit about the history of television, you know, the invention of television and early children's TV to sort of frame it up and and wrote, you know, wrote a, a long chapter with, based on what I had. And, you know, again, using designs and doodles and using the Muppet Show book and sources like that where I could pull quotes from and sent that chapter to them. And said, so, this is the way I would do it. You know, this is my audition tape for you, you guys. And uh, they got back to me and said, we get it. This is we're, this is the way we this is the way we would like this to be done. And so once that happened, I was kind of in. And um, and at that point, you, as I would say, you were you're a made man because um, if I'm saying, oh my gosh, it would be so, I would love to be able to talk to Frank Oz about that. They're like, got it, we'll get you Frank. Um, and I could get I could get those sorts of people because Frank Oz is a notoriously, to notoriously tough nut to crack. Uh, doesn't like to talk to people, doesn't like to talk on the record. And, um, no, you know, having know. the... <laughs> Having, yeah, having the, Hensons, having the Hensons behind me and being able to, you know, send an email to Frank and say, I know you don't know who I am. You know, I'm writing Jim's biography. The Hensons know I'm here. You know, they gave me information. like that. That really helped push open doors. And I actually ended up meeting with with Frank, Oz, I think, three times, um, who is, is is a pussycat. I know he probably wouldn't like me to tell you guys that, but but uh, an absolute pussycat, a, a lovely guy, charming guy, smart guy. And as you can imagine, a really, really funny guy. Well, so, I, gotta, I have a little um, question about that, though. When you say you met with him three times, like, how do you, obviously, probably at, after the first time, you don't know that you're going to have to meet with him later. You find some hole or a question for him, right? Like, how do you know, like, when's the right time to talk about, talk to that person? Because obviously you want to try to minimize, uh, just uh, out of uh, just being efficient, as many right. kind of meetings like that as you have to have. 
Yeah, so so the fir first thing you do is you assume you're only gonna get one bite at the apple. So you go in as well prepared as you can. You try to ask them to block off as, as much time as you can possibly get. And I think Oz initially was gonna give me four hours, something wow. like that. Um, and so I did all the research I could because there's a, there's a great clip you'll find online someplace. And it's fairly recent of Oz in, I think the UK being interviewed and the guy asked him a question and Oz goes, God, no, no, man, your research sucks. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> it's like, there's a new one. <clears throat> and I didn't want to be that guy. So I went in as well prepared as I could. And, um, cause I didn't, you know, I, I didn't want that to happen. And he actually, you know, he answered the door and we walked around the corner to this, to this diner that he loved. That's no longer there apparently. And, um, talked over breakfast for like, you know, for almost five hours, but he would not let me tape him. Um, Oz does not want to be recorded because he told me, as he told me, I don't want it to end up on the fucking internet. Um, so, <laughs> so I wasn't allowed. So I just I took notes furiously. So I, you know, Oz ate breakfast. I did not because I was just taking notes furiously on everything. He actually, well, and I see, I didn't pull this, but he actually, um, when I was asking about the early days of the Muppet workshop, he actually turned over my notes and drew an, um, like a floor plan of the workshop on my notes, which was pretty great. Um, so, you know, so I could know where he sat and where Jane sat when she was teaching him how to lip sync and where Jim's office was and where the, where the dartboard was and the moose head and, you know, he showed me everything, but, but getting, getting to your point, Adam, um, what tends to happen is, you know, you, you try to get everything you think you're going to need. And then as you start writing, you start finding these holes, uh, in your narrative that would be nice to fill. Um, um, I think one of those holes I had in my narrative, in fact, was the LSD story in the book, because that was um, a reported conversation that I found. It, it was it was in another interview somebody else had conducted that was in the archives. Somebody who, uh, who, who, was, who, was, who was dead, I can't remember who had told the story, but it was a reported conversation. So as a biographer, you're, you know, you're, you love to see those, but you gotta be a little careful about it. So I was, you know, trying to back into finding out who was in the room and it turned out that, you know, Oz was actually in the room. So, um, so when I got him again, that was one of those questions I wanted to ask. So I did meet with him one more time at his house. And then I say it the third time, but the third time he just let me send him a bunch of stuff in writing. And then he answered those questions. And he actually did call me at one point with, uh, cause I sent him a first draft of the book and, um, and he sent me and he called me on the phone. And I, I think I still even have the, um, the caller ID saved on one of my old phones. that says like Osnowitz Frank. Um, you know, this is New York's phone number. I saved that. Um, and he called me to like give me some corrections, including like you know a typo, which you know just <laughs> oh, no, a grammatical error on this page. Next to come here, which I think oh, you love. Yeah. Uh, you love. But so so that's you know so you, 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 the first ones where you try to get it all. Then as you're writing, you tend to find out where the holes in your narrative are. Another person who was great about responding to questions was. Um, Michael Frith was always really good about sending really long, funny, gorgeous emails, <laughs> very, you know, yeah. pages and pages to scroll through. Um, most of them were really good about it. The Hensons themselves were all really great about it. The Hensons, of course, were really great with their time. You know, I, I, I think I spoke with Lisa uh, in in Burbank, uh, you know, out in, out in their offices, I think three times as well, too. And Jane tended to be in New York and at times in Washington, DC, which was right near where I live. So at times I talked to her third down in DC and I got Jane a lot of times as well. So, so, you know, it's one of those, as I always say, you don't know what you don't know until you know, you don't know it. Um, and so once I knew I didn't know something, that was when I'd have to go back and figure out who am I going to have to talk to, to fill in this gap here. Yeah. Totally. Wow. Yeah. And that, that's gotta be like a blessing and a curse of, uh, working with someone who's relatively contemporary, uh, you know, or certainly the people who he worked with and, and knew are still around of, of trying to like, there, it's a wonderful resource to have them, but it is like you kind of said, like threading the needle of how do I back into this or how do I bring it up without burning a bridge or anything like that? Yeah. That, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, something like the LSD story, for example, I was, I was actually, I was kind of worried. I'm like, God, if I bring this up, are people going to be like, well, there we go. Of course, that's all you're interested in is the drug story. You know? So I was, so I was even, that, it, I was a little nervous about that. You're right. Those are the, those are the risks you run, but you know, you, I could, but fortunately by that point, I think a lot of them knew I wasn't up to shenanigans. Yeah. Um, so I could ask, and I'd be like, you know, I ran into something really interesting here. Um, and could, could kind of frame it that way. But, um, you know, I mean, Oz was so funny at one point because I was, you know, Jim s s smoked pot. I mean, that was the one substance he ever really indulged in. But I said something about, um, you know, I was like, well, I know even on The Muppet Show, I mean, there was a little bit, it was, uh, I think, Richard and Jerry, right? And Oz goes, duh. <laughs> you know, <it> was, <laughs> the worst kept secret around. He was really funny. No, that's, that's crazy. Wow.
Yeah, what a shame he would. I totally understand why he didn't have you uh, record it, but man, what what a shame that uh, that must have made it more of a chore too. Just out of curiosity, for like the second time, did he warm up and and say he was okay to record, just to make it easier for you for your job, or no? Okay, just to- no, no. And I, I ended up I had like these big yellow notepads and pencil, and I was writing. You know, I could get about eight words a page because my handwriting when I'm trying to write fast yeah. is just so god awful oh, yeah. that I was just writing these big swoops. You know, on, on the pages, I was trying to get as much down verbatim as I could. And then as, as soon as I got done, I was like, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Frank. So it was so great. And then I like sprinted across Central Park to back to my hotel and like ran back to my room so I could just download on my laptop as much as I could possibly remember uh, to try to make sure. And that was one of the reasons I had Oz read the, the draft of the book, because I wanted to be sure his quotes oh, were right. Sure, because, yeah. of course. because there were times, you know, where, where you know, I, I made a point of writing down the F-bomb because that's the coin of the realm for him, which is so funny. Um, and and really makes that voice actually jump off the page. But you know, I mean, so I so when I when I decided to lead them in, and I, and I did have a, a conversation with my editor about should we leave in the f bombs, and he was like, oh my god, yes. Um, but I so I did, that was one of the reasons I, I sent it to Oz in the first draft. Just you know, I want him to see that like you know I was being very diligent about the notes I took. But if anything sounds off, you know, you let me know. And like he was fine. Wow. He was more interested in like and I said like in my bad punctuation I had more than his quote. So. <laughs> Wow. Oh my goodness. Um, so in, uh, you know, in doing the story about Jim, like, does that end up bringing you to, uh, like working on a George Lucas? Uh, cause there's, you know, some, certainly a fair deal of overlap there. Um, does it kind of become like one project leading you to the next? Yeah, that one it, it, it literally did because of course with Jim and George Lucas working together on, on Labyrinth, um, I had, um, so when I was, when I was clearing photos for the, for the biography, um, I used in the book, I mean, first of all, when you're writing the chapter about Labyrinth, I mean, it's just so much fun to get to write George Lucas, even somewhat. Um, you know, it's funny as those of us who write nonfiction, we view everybody in our book as a character. So it is really fun. You get to a certain chapter, you're like, Oh boy, I get to write this character. Now I get to write George Lucas. I get to write David Bowie. You know, I get, to, so it's, so it, it, we always look forward to writing those characters. So when I was writing the Labyrinth chapter, it's like, man, Lucas is a great character. How fascinating, how fun that would be. But I hadn't really thought about him as a subject until, um, I was clearing the photos and I used the picture in the book of it. It's a publicity still. So technically it was, I didn't have to clear it. It's a publicity still. Um, but I went ahead and I got a contact inside Lucasfilm. Um, I knew somebody that had taken a job there inside and they were like, well, here's an, you know, this is the, this is the person you can contact to clear these things. So I actually ended up, um, with somebody who worked for Lucas and I just, you know, I sent them, I told them, I'm like, I have, I'm writing the biography of Jim Henson and of course, George, you know, Mr. Lucas, Mr. Lucas, of course, Mr. Lucas is in it and I'm using this photo and, um, I just want to be sure you guys are good with it. And I, there was no paperwork in that. So like, I just want to let you know, are we good? And they, and through his people, they were back. I'm like, no, 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 we're good. That's fine. Thank you very much for asking. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that, that could be a really cool second subject. And since I now had a contact inside Lucasfilm, when I got done with the Henson book, well, two things happened. <clears throat> so I had that contact inside Lucasfilm, but also my editor on the Jim Henson bio called me about three weeks after the book came out and said, because they pub Ballantyne is a an imprint of Random House and they publish all the Star Wars novels. And, um, and my editor called me and said, oh, um, we just got a note here from George Lucas, who read the Jim Henson bio and, you know, just sent us a note. It's just like, Jim Henson was a great friend of mine. What a creative genius. I loved his biography. And I was like, great. He is dying to be done. Let's do this thing now. So, so like I reached out through my contact that I had at Lucasfilm and I wrote like this long thing about let's get you on, you know, you're good. You, he was just getting ready to sell his company. And I was like, let's get you on the record now. Let's do this for real. And um and uh not so much i mean uh i did get a note back from his people said no what the, what they actually said is this is not something george is interested in doing at this time and i kept thinking at this time was my window but it never happened um but a lot of people said later oh wow he told you no usually he never says anything um so that was you know, i guess kind of cool but um uh, it, yeah it was it, it, so so close and yet so far on that it was it was it was a uh, it was very painful but uh but it, you know it was fun to do that sort of dance dance with him there but i uh i i was i was so hopeful that he was gonna finally say yes but uh yeah. but no yeah so so you know someone like jim henson and george lucas and dr seuss like it all makes a lot of sense in, in a lot of ways too it's surprising that 
they a lot of those people didn't have big uh, biographies like this written. But like when you were just talking about uh, wanting to do one on like Rango Star, how do you know? How do you decide whether someone is um, you know, known enough? Like if they're if they're too known, it's probably already been done, right? But if they're not known enough, it, it might. Is there a market for it? Now, again, clearly with these ones, there's it's, it's obvious market. But um, how, I don't know, like what, what do you look for besides just there isn't one yet in that person? Yeah, I, well, I mean, those are all great questions. Those are all exactly the things that I discuss with my agent, with my editor. Uh, you know, like Ringo, for example, hasn't been done yet. Um, there's no biography of Ringo. Uh, meanwhile, there's, you know, Lennon biographies are a cottage industry. And, and I mean, I was born like the year Sergeant Pepper came out. I'm like kind of post Beatles, but I'm a huge Beatles fan. And I would love to do a Beatles book. And my editor at one point, he's like, you know, he's like, you know, who buys Beatles books is Beatles books nerds. They're not necessarily like these huge sellers, you know? And I was like, but I own, I own every one of them. He's like, yeah, well, that's you. Um, <laughs> But so, you know, it's like apparently there's this industry where like Lennon is out here in front selling a whole bunch per year and books on McCartney are kind of in here and George is over here a little bit and Ringo's like in the next room. So, mm -hmm. but I was like, but we would have the only one. Um, but, you know, so it's one of those that I have to kind of rely on people who know the industry to tell me like what they think people jump. I still think Ringo would sell, but, you know, but Ringo said no. And that's a book that. Um, again, I, I wrote the Lucas book without his participation. Ringo, you really kind of need. And again, partly because there is no other book on him. Um, I could sit at this desk and never leave and write 900 pages on Ringo. But um, but to make a book that people are going to be really interested in instead of reading like, oh, yeah, I remember reading that in Mark Lewison's book. And I remember reading that like you really kind of need him on board. So so this is the you know, this is the quandary that I'm in because I tend to write about these big pop culture figures that everyone knows. And when you start looking around for the next big pop culture figure everyone knows, as you were saying, Adam, they've probably been done. Um, what you have to sometimes say is, well, but they haven't been done well. Um, Lucas, for example, um, the last time he'd been really done, I mean, there was one in right, I can't remember who wrote it now, all of a sudden I've lost it, but it came, it came out right as right before Phantom Menace came out. So I think it came out in 1998 or 99, something like that. And, and so it didn't have, it, it wasn't up to date. Before that, there was that earlier one, Skywalking, that Dale Pollock wrote, which is a great book because Pollock knew Lucas and interviewed him and like, got all those great stories about his childhood you're not going to find anywhere. And it's the book we all have to plumb for that information. But Pollock's the one that ruined it for the rest of us. After, after Lucas read that book, uh, Lucas was like, I'm never participating in anything like this ever again. <laughs> so, so, so Dale Pollock ruined it for the rest of us on that one. Um, so, so those are the issues you run into. You know, like I said, there was, there was another one called, I, I wish I could remember what the other Lucas book was that came out in like the late 90s. It wasn't great. So when I was even making my case for this and I was writing another books, I was like, you know, there was, there was one 20 years ago. Um, it was right before he got back in the biz again, like Phantom Menace wasn't even out yet. So like, there's clearly a whole lot of ground to cover again here. And, and, you know, and, and plus I could do this my way, which I think is better than that guy's way. Um, so, so those are the kind of cases you make. Dr. Seuss, for example, had been the subject of a book by people in 1992, right after he died from 94, um, by people who were friends of his. Um, so there's, I don't want to say there's an agenda in there, but you know, I mean, it's, it's it, their relationship with him is different than the relationship I would have. Um, so, you know, I'm a little more willing to dive into some of the darker issues with him and some of the more complicated issues. And it's a, it's a lovely book. And I actually spoke with a woman, it was written by a husband and wife who knew him and he, um, only the wife is alive. And, and I spoke with her and interviewed her and she's lovely. Um, but it's a very, but that makes it again a very different kind of biography, and especially you get into the point in that book where they come into the story. There's an awful lot of, and then we went to this party at this person's house in San Diego, and these ten people were here, and I'm like, I don't know who anybody is in the social circle here, but um, but it's a very different kind of book and a very different kind of relationship. So when I was making the case about the Seuss book, I was like, you know, he hasn't been done since 1992, and there's a lot more that's gone on, and his name has been remarketed, and he sort of fell out of favor. But you know, let let's let's let somebody else who didn't have this relationship or has a different relationship, go through those archives now in San Diego. And I actually, because of Jim Henson, um, I knew Michael Frith, who had been one of his editors in the 60s. And so I was able to, you know, talk with Michael Frith about that and get, you know, go in there and say, I'm going to talk to you about your other good friend and, 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 and boss this time. We're going to talk to Dr. Seuss. 
Um, so a lot of it is, you know, can you bring something new and different to it? Um, and, and so again, getting, that's a long roundabout way, Adam, of saying, I haven't been able to find that next subject that I feel like I can bring something different to, that I can bring my own thing yeah. to. But it sounds that's like, that needs to really touch on it. Yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like also, it's also just so much reliant on your agent and, and editor too. Cause they have to, if they, if you can't convince them that there's a market for it or that it'll engage people, it almost doesn't, I imagine it might not even matter um, how much you want to do it or think it should be done to an extent, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know that I'm ready to say who it was that I, I had pitched very hard recently. Um, I wrote a long proposal for this person who has died back in the 60s, but uh, it was somebody I was really, really interested in. And I wrote what I thought was a really lovely, <laughs> really solid proposal for it. I was fascinated by this particular person and sent it in. And, you know, my agent's like, this is, this is, this is, fantastically written and the research you've got on it is great. It's just not going to go. No one's going to care. Um, and I still maintain people would care, but that's just me. Um, I don't know the market. I don't know what's moving. I don't know what sells and, and they do. And you kind of have to put your life in the hands of those who know these things, your agent and your editor. Um, so, so again, I have, you know, probably this 35 or 40 page proposal that didn't go anywhere that I'm still very, very proud of and convinced something could happen with it. But, uh, but no, it's, you know, it went, it went into the trunk as they say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, it's so clear that you have a real passion and interest in the people you choose to be your subjects. And obviously you would need to, to be able to invest, you know, multiple years in, in creating the book. Um, can you describe sort of your process in learning about these people potentially having to unlearn things that uh, you know, is sort sort of out there in the ether of like, oh, that's not true, or that's not how this happened, or it's got to reshape your perspective of how or why you were interested in it, interested in them in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's actually that's a fantastic question, Cam. And actually, the way you started it is something really important, at least to me as a biographer, and that that has to do with the relationship between biographer and subject. Um, I am not one of these people who can compartmentalize. And I have a, you know, a, a friend and a colleague who um, wrote a book on Richard Nixon. And I was like, John, how could you, I mean, God, Nixon. And, you know, and he's like, you know, he was just a subject for me. He was a recent, you know, it's like peering under the microscope at the bacteria to him. Um, whereas I'm not wired that way. I live with my subjects and my wife lives with me living my subjects. And, um, and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm, I, I'm unable to disengage myself from my subject. I can't just sit down and be like, okay, sure, switch on, and now I'm gonna write this part, and then when I get done, switch off, and I walk away. Um, I'm thinking about that all the time, and I'm worrying about it, and I'm fussing about things, and I'm wondering what I need to go find. Um, I've been really lucky in that my last, in that all four of my subjects have been, for the most part, pretty decent guys um, who you don't mind, you know, I mean, Jim Henson was a pretty good guy to spend five years with. Um, you know, George Lucas, for all his, you know, weirdness and control freak stuff, was a pretty fun subject to spend four years with. Dr. Seuss, you know, I had a really, I had a very different relationship with Seuss, getting to the second part of your question, um, because Jim Henson and George Lucas, like, I grew up with that work. So I, so I was born in 67, so I'm like Sesame Street Generation 1, you know, and, I've, and I was nine when Star Wars came out because, of, like, like th those were both right in my wheelhouse. Weirdly, um, I didn't grow up with Dr. Seuss books. Like I didn't learn how to read with Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss to me was the dentist office book. So I never really, we didn't really, <laughs> like, like my mom, like my mom handed my brother and I uh, reprints of like those old mad magazine paperbacks. Like that was the stuff we were reading and like peanuts paperback stuff like Seuss, like we just didn't have the Seuss books around. So my, my relationship with him was very different than it was the, my other subjects uh, and Irving to some extent too. I didn't know much about him. I got more interested in him as I read up on him. But Seuss is the better better one to use as this example because more people know him and his work. Irving's movies um, aren't as good, so. Right, exactly. Like everybody knows Legend of Sleepy. Like I would always ask people with Irving, like, you know, have you read Legend of Sleepy Hollow? No. Can you tell me the, the story? Yes. Like it's weird. It's one of those things in like, especially like American DNA. Even if you've never read Legend of Sleepy Hollow, you can give me the basic, you know, posts in that story. Um, but Dr. Seuss, like when I got re ready to write that book, I could have given you, I could have named six books, like probably the greatest hits. I didn't know I wrote 65, you know, I mean, so, so it's like, I had a lot of learning to do on Seuss and that made that book in a way a little bit different than the other ones I had done because I'm learning with you 
kind of as I go through. Um, and like, it, it, it was a little bit more like, gosh, isn't this neat? Wow, look at this, look what's going on. Come with me over here. Like, like look what I found over here. It was a little bit different. I mean, I was doing that of course with the other books too, but this one, like it was all about the exploration. It, was, it made it, I think a really different kind of book in a way. Um, it actually got me some of the best reviews of my life. Like, I don't know, maybe I should approach more subjects I'm not that familiar with, but, but I mean, it, it, it is a subject that is on, as my editor put it, it's on my shelf. Um, because when I got done with the George Lucas book and was trying to come up with the next subject, um, I have worked in politics my entire life. And at one point I was like, you know, I could write about a president. I could do, you know, something like, like I've done. And, and my editor's like, this is why I love my editor. He's like, well, Brian, I'm not saying no. He's so lovely about my feelings. I'm not saying no. Um, but that takes you off of your shelf. And I hadn't really thought about it until that time that I had a shelf. Um, and that really frames the way you think. And that's making it hard now moving on to the next one here. Like, what's still on that shelf? Wow. So the short answer is, yes, we're happy to be the next subject of your book. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Gosh. Oh, my God. I have a question about that. I mean, um... can I, can I dig through your private papers then, please. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yes. We've got we're an ready. open book. Uh, the Becoming, I mean, the Jim Henson one was the first one that I read of yours, which, which was remarkable. It was absolutely amazing. And then I also did read the, uh, the Becoming Dr. Seuss. And that really... Um, Again, similar to you, like I read the kid, the books as a kid, and it was oh, so inspiring to me in so many ways. Uh, really energized me to want to be more creative. But I have a question for you about that. Did writing about a writer, someone who made up stories, did that ever inspire you to do um, fictional writing in any way? Um. You know, I was an English major in college and like every English major, I always fancied myself being like a great novelist and I am a terrible novelist, uh, which I found out early. I mean, like when I, <laughs> I, I can always bring this back to the Beatles. There's a great story Ringo Starr tells about how like he would go away and write songs by himself and then he'd come back and show them to the Beatles and they're like, you do know that that's like Jailhouse Rock. Like you just rewrote a classic. <laughs> Um, and I was, you know, when I first got out of college, I was trying to write novels and I was trying to write children's stories. And everyone's like, this actually is, you know, Wizard of Oz or whatever. You know, it was like, I just, yeah. I am, I am a terrible plotter. Um, I'm, I'm a hack when it comes to that stuff. I don't know how to do it. It's just not my talent. I, um, I can't hear it. That, I always say that like, if, if you're a writer, you can write what you hear. And I can't hear fiction, I don't think. Um, and I'm one of these people that like, I, I guess uh, as my wife always says, like, you know, uh, she's like, people like you because you're very forgiving. Like I can't, for the most part, tell a bad novel from a good one for the most part, because like, I just read them and I'm like, wow, this person plotted this. This is amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I just think of it from a perspective too, of just like, I, you hear people like going to a coffee shop, like again, like even theater guys, like he can't really write something wrong. He has so much freedom to do whatever right. he wants. Whereas like you can, and I mean, not, maybe not even to your own fault, get something wrong, even if maybe someone you interview gives you the wrong information or something like that it's like i feel like like i say this with love but i feel like you got to be the kind of kid who loves doing homework to want <laughs> yeah. to want to do what what you're doing well let, let me give let me give you a story there real quick on that so um first of all your point about a coffee shop is um hang on a second i'm gonna write down so i don't forget your second point the car um so the point about the coffee shop like i always say that those of us who write nonfiction, we're so jealous of those who write fiction because they can go to the coffee shop and sit there and look cool, like on their laptops, writing their novels, because I, everything they need to do that job is all right here. Um, everything we need to do our jobs is in big black binders and it's on tape and it's in tons of files on our laptops and things, you know, like I still print everything. I, I still print everything out and highlights and things like that. I can't, I can't organize it and find it unless I have seen it and touched it. So my organization system is very analog. Um, so we can't sit in a coffee shop and work because we need all our sort of crap with us to do it. So I'm always very jealous of those who can sit there and like everything's right here. Like we just can't do that. Um, but to the point about about getting stuff wrong, even when you're like, you know, so that was when I was talking about the reported conversation with the LSD story um, in the George Lucas bio. He tells a story, maybe he didn't tell, but like his best friend who drove with him from from his from Marin County down to USC in, I think, 1960, ugh, 63, maybe it was. I'm going to get the years wrong because I haven't gone back and double checked this recently. But um, told a story about like him and Lucas piling into Lucas's Camaro and driving down to USC. And, I come, and like I saw this story told by like the guy who was in the car with him. That story is in the book. And damn it, if like every car aficionado didn't send me an email saying, 
the uh, the Camaro didn't come out until 1967, so there's no way they could have driven that car. <laughs> oh uh, and I was like, oh, oh and, and, and it's one of those you take yourself because you're like, you know what? It's probably something I should have checked, and it's probably something even a copy editor might have checked. But it was like I was like, well, it's like I think it was his friend John Frankenstein, or whatever that funky name is. I'm like, you know, I was yeah. like, the guy who was there reported it this way. Like, why would he not get that right? Damn yeah. it, if that wasn't wrong, and every car collector didn't get like emailed to let me know. About what it. Uh, that's so funny. So too. Such a big crossover between Star Wars and car collectors, but apparently there is. Sure, yeah. and for <laughs> something like that too, like that doesn't discredit the story, right? That just means that one little fact about that story was incorrect. Right? Yeah, I mean, you kick yourself because that's when you start to get the the cynics are like, well, if we can't trust you to get yeah. this small piece of information right, how do we know anything else in the book is true? And you know, I, I guess I guess fair yeah. enough, but. Uh, but that's the stuff that makes you crazy. But again, that's when I was like, the guy who was there reported it that way. But I, so you're like, you know, sometimes you take their word for it. And I, I, I mean, I had a, I had a, a Trans Am and I kind of knew the history of the Firebird and I know the Camaro is kind of a long line, but it still didn't even occur to me that like, I was like, oh, that year's got to be wrong. Yeah. Oh my God. No, totally. That's interesting. You know, that's getting me thinking too, uh, you know, cause we're, we're talking now in, in 2021, the your Jim Henson biography came out almost ten years ago, and um, you know we're we're still we're still talking about it. Um, and you know you mentioned the George Lucas. Like, how long do you are tales <clears throat> typically on your book? Like, because I've seen you in other Jim Henson documentaries now talking about these different things. Like, um, mm -hmm. it's got to be uh, both a blessing and a curse to continue to be like the biographer, right? Or is that something that you kind of have in your mind? Is like this might be part of the legacy and this might be part of what I keep doing uh, beyond the book? Well, you know, I, I actually do think about that and um, I could not be happier if the first line of my obituary is Jim Henson biographer Brian J. Jones died today. Uh, I would be honored to have that uh, continue to be part of part of my story as well. I mean, it's it, it's surreal to me when I think about you know, I remember where I was when I heard that Jim died in 1990. You know, I just moved to Washington, D.C., and I had my first real job. Um, and I still remember this. And it's weird to think about, you know, being there and then realizing, my God, in 20 some odd years, I'm going to be his biographer. Um, it's a pretty awesome responsibility and like every good sense of the word. I mean, it's awesome in that it's fun and it's also awesome in that it's awe inspiring. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I am, I feel a real privilege to be part of that legacy. Um, you know, he's not really part of mine, I guess he is, but like, I'm really honored to be part of his and to be part of that legacy and to be like asked, uh, when people want to talk about that's, that's why when people, you know, who are doing podcasts and, and our Muppet fans, like want to talk about Muppets, I'm like, absolutely. Let me make sure I get you the information on this because <laughs> this is a big deal. And I know I've got that info. So um, so, you know, it's a real responsibility. I feel it's a great responsibility. And I love I love that, you know, I, I get that with George Lucas. Um, you know, every time a new Star Wars movie comes out or like when the Mandalorian debuted, like I'm like, well, let's count it down. And then sure enough, like here come the emails on it. Um, so I, I love that. Um, when Dr. Seuss, when the six books got pulled recently, um, you know, I got uh, I hid, <laughs> but I got a lot of phone calls. I got a lot of phone calls that day from people who wanted me to go on, you know, various TV and radio shows. So I'm quitting Twitter so, forever. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, you know, it's something I take very seriously, and I'm very honored to be there. So, um, so yeah, I I don't have any any problems with it at all. I'm I'm delighted. And what do you think about like knowing that some of these books, especially with again ones like Dr. Seuss and George Lucas and Jim Henson, uh, like inspiring other people to do some of these things and become a big thing like maybe reading your book is what got them into this type of a thing like even even wondering that like like there's a jim henson biopic coming out i think next year i think it's gonna be called muppet man it's unofficial i don't think it's official yet but like what if like the person who greenlit that did because maybe they read your book and were inspired by it or maybe they're using your book for some uh writing inspiration <laughs> some outline <on> the script <laughs> yeah as an outline yeah. who knows <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not sure the people who were doing Muppet Man uh, are using my book, but, um, but no, I, I love that. I mean, I, I get emails a lot from people who are like, you know, reading about Jim and how he, um, you know, was told no on the Muppet Show pilots, you know, so many times, but just kept, kept trying and kept hurting. I knew he was going to succeed, really inspired me. And, you know, a lot of people say I, be, I went back and became an artist again. You know, I'd stopped being a musician and hearing about just that stick to from him. And even from somebody like George Lucas, who wants to run the table all the time, 
Um, I, I love that because I mean, that's, that's my version um, as, I mean, I'm an artist in the sense that I'm a, I'm a writer, but it's like, that's my version of paying it forward. Like, I love that. I love when people um, read something that it's just dumb me sitting here in my office, typing words on a page and people read it and are inspired. I mean, that's really, um, it, it, it almost like chokes me up to talk about. I, I love when people just write and say, I just want to let you know that like I, that Jim's story really inspired me. And you'll see a lot of times on Twitter, even I'll say, um, you know, Jim would be delighted to hear that. Cause I think he would, I think Jim would love to know. I mean, I'm, I'm just the messenger on this. I mean, it's, you know, I think Jim Henson himself would be delighted to know that people saw what he was doing and saw what he went through. And were like, I'm, I'm going to go out there and do that too. That's exactly what he wanted to do in the world. So I love hearing that. Well, that's so great. And that's, yeah, just all the way around has to be a wonderful part of, of the paying it forward. Um, well, you know, I, 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 have, I have a little question, too, because uh, Jim, the Jim Henson one was the first one I had read uh, of, of yours. And I got to I got to be uh, first of all, again, I want to spread uh, I want to start this by saying it's remarkable and super inspiring. But I have to admit, when I first started reading it, I was like, oh, man, I was I was a, I was surprised where you started, like how far like it wasn't just like with the birth of Jim Henson or him, you know, as a kid. It was like starting with his was it actually, was his parents or his grandparents, was it? Like, it no, goes, it starts. It, start, it starts basically with and, and we'll talk more about this. It basically starts with Oscar Henricks, the Civil War era map maker. Yeah, I know. I right. was like I was like, whoa, <laughs> it's kind of like when I because I went to school for art education and I, I had to take art history classes like, oh, art history is going to be fun. Jackson Pollock. I'm like, oh, my gosh, we're starting off with like Egyptian <laughs> frescoes, Egyptian pottery. I'm like, that's the not Stone the, Age. Yeah, I know, like the Stone Age. I'm like, well, that's not the fun part of art history. No, and, and, and Adam, it's, it's totally fair. I'll, yeah. And I'll tell you. And I'll tell you and I, 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 I'm like, there was a line something about Jim Hansen. Henson's, Henson's uh, uh, grandpa checking out his grandma's legs. I'm just like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, no I, I, I often feel the same way. And it's, it's a fine line you walk as a biographer. Like, for example, I love um, Neil Gabler's Walt Disney bio. But even when he starts that bio off, like, you know, where he does, I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to have to go through this. And like, I think even Ron Chair, I think even Ron Chernow in the Hamilton biography starts off talking about like the way the rocks formed like in the, you know, the prehistoric era down in, you know, the Virgin Islands or whatever it is. You know? It's like, oh, God, God help us. Um, so I tried to I tried to keep that opening Jim centric in the sense that what what I wanted people to know about Jim was there's a through line artistically from him uh, to his grandmother, dear, and then to her father, Oscar Henrichs, the map maker. Um, so I wasn't going to tr try to spend too much time on Oscar's entire family. I was fascinated by the fact that, like, you know, he married and then he ended up committing suicide and the Washington Post reported on it. Like, there was a lot of interesting stuff. And, uh, and there was a whole lot more interesting stuff that didn't get into it. Um, in a way, that chapter is kind of, and, and I understand, believe me, I understand where readers come from. And they're like, really, we have to go this far back. But um, in a way, that chapter is kind of my gift to the Henson family mm -hmm. um, because they had done some of the research but didn't have all that. For, so, for example, when I went to go interview Heather Henson, um, I walked into her apartment in New York and she had like like almost like the Ancestry.com tree taped up on the wall, like people, you know, taped up on the wall with, you know, uh, you know, thread between them, linking them together. So you know, who was there. And I stood there and for like two hours, I went through this family tree with her. Um, you know, like telling her who was who and like le how people linked up and who was, you know, and, and they were all fascinated by Oscar, um, which is actually not where Jim got the name Oscar for the Muppet. But, um, but, you know, they were fascinated by those stories and they'd heard a lot of the stories about deer. And Jim, in fact, at one point had interviewed his parents um, on tape on just this old, you know, cassette tape um, that I had and then had they digitized for me. Um, where he's interviewing his parents about their parents. So so that's where I got a lot of that information about the family in Hyattsville when they first moved to Maryland and what it was like in Leland and things like that. It came directly from a conversation Jim had with his parents, which is a biographer, something that you love. Um, and one of the best parts of that tape is you get to the very end and it's like 1971 and, and you get to the end of the tape and Jim goes, oh, I think we should probably say, um, you know, it's 1971. We're here on Donna Rowena in Albuquerque. And that was the moment, first of all, I had my headphones on and I went shit and sat up because I grew up, I grew up half a mile from Donna Rowena in Albuquerque um, and had no idea. I had no idea Jim had any connections at all with Albuquerque. But anyway, I heard, so he talked about that. And then you hear Lisa Henson, who's like 11 years old, come in and she's like, 
Why would you put that on there? Why is anybody going to care about that? Why would you even say that? And this is the moment as a biographer that gives you chills. And I'm listening into headphones. And Jim says, because one day somebody might be interested in knowing who we are and why we were here and what we were doing. I love that moment. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. that really is. Well, yeah, because so Jim clearly did document so much, which uh, made your job I'm sure there was still obstacles in this job, but made it probably easier than it otherwise could have been. And there's probably a lot of crazy people that do that <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. and document <laughs> stuff where it's like where it's never going to be used. And I just I just wondering what you think about that. Like, how conscious should people be? Adam is subtweeting of, me now. <laughs> yes, no, because I, I remember I, I, something rings in my head. The camera door. always say we'd be working on something, and he'd say something or take a picture or take, and he'd say, "Be kind to your future biographer." I'm like. <laughs> I just look at like, well, I mean, what are you, what do you mean? I mean, you, you know, Jim, Jim really did spoil me as a biographer in a way because he did document so much. Yeah. Um, and you don't really run into that that often as a biographer. You've got to do a lot of the digging. Jane Henson told me at one point, Jim, from the time he was young, was absolutely convinced he was going to be successful and famous. And that was why he saved and documented everything, which is a pretty amazing mindset uh, and happened to come true. Um, and like I said, moving forward, that does spoil you as a biographer because not everybody does that. Yeah. <laughs> they don't keep everything. Well, I mean, I, I, Jim, I, I feel like I'd even push back on that. I don't know if it's an amazing. I think it's a mindset that maybe too many people have. Yeah. In, in <laughs> <a way. laughs> and then Cameron Garrity's telling, saying, yeah. because I'm like, oh, okay. No, I mean, obviously it was pr amazing and remarkable and yeah. thankful for Jim. But um, and yeah. I and I do think it's funny because uh, you know, I'm a person who kind of documents my life too. I have a whole, you know, because here's the thing, because like. Because I, I even have a separate YouTube channel where, where I just kind of have all my family stuff, too. And it's not because I'm, I want people to look at it. It's just making it accessible for my family. Because I've got family in Florida, in California, all over the place. And right. I don't want to have to send them a video. If they want to see it, it's just there. Rather than – because, like, my childhood tapes are – are, uh, turning to dust on VHSs in my parents' closet somewhere, probably. Whereas, like, these ones are just kind of, like, like in a way, it'd be nice to kind of go back and look at that, but, like, what a chore it would be. I'd have to find a VCR and then hope mm -hmm. those even work and then hope the video wasn't taped over. Like, yeah, I, don't know, I just I feel like more people should try to just document their stuff and making it more accessible. Yeah. I mean, it, it does make me dis despair for the future of biography in a way because, like, we're still able to write about subjects who did a lot of stuff on paper, like wrote stuff down and put it on paper. Yeah. Um, I don't, write, I don't write stuff down on paper today. I do everything electronically. Mm -hmm. I'll hold it in my email for a while, then I'll delete it. Um, I'll be like, ah, oh, no one's gonna care about that. Who cares about that receipt? Jim Henson saved receipts and like had the paper receipts in a drawer and they were actually useful. Um, future biographers coming back to write about those of us who are living now, I don't know where, where you're gonna be able to get your hands on a lot of records. And people don't write letters anymore. Um, they're sending emails, but you know, I'm, I delete emails or I had emails that I was writing to people on three accounts ago that don't exist anymore. So, so I, I really, it's going to be interesting to see how biography shapes up in the next 30, 50 years as the written record. I mean, there's, there's still like official files and things like that on government records, things like that, but written records of, between people, between real people just, don't, just doesn't exist anymore. That's such a great point. I, I had thought of that um, before of like, yeah, your your text chains and stuff, they disappear, you know, you send disappear after a year mm -hmm. so that they don't take up space on your phone. And yeah, it's those those human moments that you've been able to capture uh, in in your in your writing and another biographer's writing. It, it really does completely change that dynamic in a in a really interesting well, way. Well, it's also interesting. I remember hearing about this, too. It's uh, just like it, it's, it's all owned by one one person it's all owned or all one company it's all going to be kind of owned by google in a way google and apple yeah i mean and i don't know do can you foia google or not FOIA or whatever like can you send a request to google and be like this person's been dead 50 years can i get their email that doesn't exist i know what their email was in 2018 can i get everything that was in that email probably not yet but i bet you in 50 years i, I bet you really because the one thing that's interesting i heard someone talking about this like thinking about like even even thinking about like a president today like the president 50 years from now, or maybe a little longer, like their homework assignments are in a Google Cloud somewhere. Their homework assignments when they were in elementary school. 
are yep. going to be like, I mean, to think about like how much documentation a company like Google Google is going to have of, I mean, that's part of why Google wanted to be like in, in education. Like it, it's, I think it's like free or, or inexpensive or unlimited space for, for kids and for educators and stuff. Like they got that market corner. It's just, it's going to be, and another thing too, will they even have a biographer for it? It's just going to be an algorithm that writes it. Oh, write me a biography on Cameron Garrity. Boop. Yeah. And then like, the and, I mean, and, and, and will the tech keep up? I mean, years ago, we'd have been like, okay, you're in good shape because everything that we have is on this CD ROM here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't have, I don't have anything at home that will read. I don't have anything in my house that will read a CD ROM now. Yeah. 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 Let alone a floppy disk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's like the tech just keeps moving and a lot of that stuff is archived in, you know, ones and zeros on old tech that we're just not going to be able to, you know, it'll be. You know, it'd be like nowadays you're like, oh, look, here's an eight track. Do I have an eight track player? Can we do that? <laughs> like just this ancient deck? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's amazing. But I mean, but like people are like, I'll hold this up. And because I see this show up on Twitter every once in a while. But like, so here's the original letter that Mr. You know, that uh, Francis Dion wrote to Jim Henson about the the uh, the cube. And I, you've seen people talk about this on Twitter. Um, you know, he, he's got this long typed out note. You can kind of, you can kind of see this stuff typed out. It's hard to read, but, um, and this is where he says, um, congratulate yourselves that your labors have sufficiently given me confidence that my own mediocrity is not so plausible as I till now have thought. The cube, despite the most disciplined attention I could give it, was a belch from the grave of Marcus Aurelius, occasioned, I might add, by the dead weight of its own dust caving in on itself. It is bluntly an experiment like any other of irony and futility. BC and AD is hardly begged off by such in-depth comment on modern day sound and fury, which, well, why go on? And then he signed it here at the bottom. Um, you've seen Jim's response quoted. I will show you the actual letter. Here is Jim's response in type. Dear Mr. Dion, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> so that letter's in the archives. Um, nowadays, it would probably have been an email that somebody sent, and Jim might have responded to the email with an email and then deleted it, and it's gone forever. Wow. No, oh, that's priceless. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm kind of glad we brought up uh, a little while ago uh, the, the Jim Henson uh, biopic or some version of what, what that might be. Uh, Obviously, you're a bit biased, but do you do you think a, a biopic is the right next step in sort of documenting and highlighting Jim for a public, or is there another way that you think um, he could or should be celebrated and recognized? No, I, I mean I think biopics are fine. I mean that's you know people who don't read, and there are a lot more people who don't read than we think. Um, We'll get Jim's story through a biopic. I mean, you know, mm. I, I first heard Mozart's story by watching Amadeus, you know, and then I went back later and read everything I could on him. But, um, you know, there's, 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 if you do a biopic right, they're fantastic. Chaplin is one of my favorite biopics, one with Robert Downey Jr. Um, so based on David Robinson's book. So, so I think it can be done right. And nowadays they make them very, you know, they do interesting things with them. The Mr. Rogers biopic, which was kind of not about Mr. Rogers, and yet it was. Mm. Mm was uh you know was was like really well done um you know and the what was the other one saving mr, mr. banks yeah. yeah which is kind of disney story but it's also okay you know there's a lot of different stories going on but first of all i mean I, everybody jokes that what are they gonna do let tom hanks play everybody yeah, tom it's, hanks that is movie, gonna be playing jim henson <laughs> that, that, that movie is, in my opinion is lovely and i think he plays a fantastic disney in it i love that movie so yeah. so you know I'm, I'm okay with other other bits of other you know media getting out there to tell these stories and you know it may inspire somebody to go and actually read the biography after that um, I mean, I i don't know anything about what they're doing with the biopic. I think the guys who are writing it was, I think one of them is the guy who did the original Muppet Man spec script that was out like 15 years ago, right? Um, which, I, which I've read. Um, and considering there was no bio at the time, like he was kind of doing what I had done, just kind of finding everything he could gather about Jim at the time. It's, there's a lot of info in there that's, that's, that's right. I mean, he, he gets a lot of it actually, actually right. Um, you know, there, there's some stuff in there that I think caused the family a little heartburn, which is why they bought the script and then shelved it. But I think they were interested in it. They, I think they wanted to sure no one else was going to make it. Um, but the conceit of it is really interesting. Like, it's kind of told through flashback, and the flashbacks are done with Muppets. 
Um, so again, it's, the script itself has, has its issues, but the setup is kind of clever. Um, and if they try to carry that conceit through into the new movie, I think it could be very interesting. Will they pull it off? Is that what they're going to do? I don't even know, but, but they could, they could do this very interesting. Now the issue they're going to have is they've got huge amounts of cross jurisdictional issues. Now they've got, yes. you know, their own company, they've got Disney, they've got Sesame, they've, you know, they've kind of got a little bit of everybody to deal with now. Um, it sounded to me at one point, like they were all playing nice. So, you know, we'll see, um, you know, I'll, it's not going to be based on my work, but I'll be there. They should hire you as a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy if they just thank me at the end. That yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's uh, that's amazing. In in your research in in Jim, are there things about him that you wish more people knew? Because like obviously people you know think about you know Kermit and the Muppets, and they have this idealized version of of who and what they are. Like, is there something like what's the the Jim Henson Hill you would die on in terms of making sure that people knew this part about or or this, these aspects of him? Yeah. Well, first of all, one of the hills I always joke that I will die on is that they are not called Muppeteers. Um, oh yeah, they're they're Muppet performers, Muppet performers. but that's I mean, I'm mostly joking about that. Um, <laughs> for, for a serious answer on that, um, I think part I think one of them is that I really hope people come to understand. And what I'm hearing about the biopic is this is not the period they're focusing on. But I think when you start learning about Jim and reading about Jim, his 1960s period is creatively stunning. Um, so much going on, so many balls in the air, so many interesting, weird projects, very few of which actually have Muppets in them. Um, I, I, I love that people come to that part of the book and are like, they have no idea because I had no idea either, really. I mean, I knew he was doing the Jimmy Dean show, which has a Muppet in it. I didn't know about the cube. I didn't know about Cyclia. I didn't know about, you know, about all these other really interesting pro you know, projects that he had going on. Um, always had something going on, just creatively restless and is doing so many different things. And he doesn't know, and that's one of the reasons I love the 60s, he, he doesn't know what he wants to be. If you look at the ads he's putting in the newspapers at that time, advertising for his company, it says, we're Muppets Incorporated, and we, we do... Uh, we do documentaries like Youth 68, and we have nightclubs like Cyclia, and we do the opening credits of new shows, and we do experimental films like Timepiece, and we also do the puppet thing. It's like the last item on his list. Um, he doesn't know how this is going to turn out. He's got a lot of different things he's doing. It's, you know, he initially wanted to get into TV to be a set designer. That was sort of his, his, you know, his bent and turned out to be exceptionally great at puppetry, I think partly because he didn't know what the rules were. Um, but what we know when we're reading it is the exclamation point at the end of that decade is Sesame Street, and that sort of defines his path forward from there. But I love the 60s, and that's one of those, those places where I hope people, you know, that's to answer that question, that's one of those spots I hope people are like, wow, I had really no idea just how versatile, how interesting, how almost like avant-garde Jim Henson could be. We always think of him as sort of this very safe family entertainer in a way. Um, and he's got just some really interesting, wild, wacky, weird stuff going on in the 60s that's just fascinating and interesting and bizarre. And, you know, Oz talked about sitting on the back of a motorcycle with a camera running and just like filming random stuff for, you know, Timepiece and for Youth 68 and for to project on the walls in, at Cyclia. So, so I love that period in his life. Um, another thing I wish more people came to appreciate is what a fantastic businessman he was. Um, I don't think he gets enough credit for that. Um, you know, single-handedly running his own company out of a brownstone from the time he was very young, actually, uh, doing it very well, but, you know, felt a real responsibility to his employees to keep projects going so people had jobs. Um, but, but an outstanding businessman who knows his work has value tells his agent, Bernie Brillstein, at one point when, you know, the dog food company in Canada says, we would like to buy the rights to Rolf the dog. And Jim tells Bernie Brillstein, they're going to pay him like $150,000 or $200,000 in like 1963 for this. Um, a lot of money. And Jim says, uh, you know, Bernie, never sell anything that I own. And that mentality kept that company going. It happens again when, um, what's his name, uh, Robert uh, uh, Holmes Accord um, buys out ATV and essentially takes the Muppet Show with him. Uh, and Jim doesn't own the rights to the Muppet Show at that point. And so he actually wagers every dollar he has to go in and get the Muppet Show and, in particular, Dark Crystal away from him. Because Jim, 
you know, and, and he's taking all of his money. And Bernie Brillstein's like, what are you doing? And Jim says, Bernie, you told me like to, you know, own everything, understand my work has value. And I could always do what I want if I did that. And that was Jim doing that, but really almost reckless at one point. I remember Cheryl Henson said like, she was nervous. They were going to be homeless uh, on this, but the, it's, it's, it's what an outstanding businessman Jim was and how he was willing to go all in on himself, knowing his work had value and to own all of his own work. No, those are two, two incredible answers. And, um, I, I think it's, um, uh, the, the story structure is so there because, I mean, I think about the, that fertile time in the sixties and, um, the timepiece that he created then, which was, you know, this, this ticking clock, um, coupled with, I mean, a, a lot has been made of, you know, what happens with him and Eisner and, and the Disney corporation and, and selling those characters. But it, it really is, um, it, it, the, the story plays out like a movie, um, in that way. It's just really intriguing to me. Yeah. Were you aware of, of the story of Jim's older brother, Paul? I was not until I got into that. I, uh, yeah. It, um, I'm trying to remember. I, th I think that's mentioned in one of the like young adult, uh, biographies about there... him. Um, or maybe I just heard, I can't remember at what point I had heard, heard about his brother, Paul, but, um, yeah. I, I had thought actually that he had been orphaned as well, but um, I, your your book steered me right on that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where at what point I, I thought that he was like alone by the time his his brother died. So yeah, I mean, I, I you know I thought the story with Paul is I think really shapes his worldview moving forward. And as you yeah. know, it, it's interesting how many of his early projects have to do with time, uh, and with you know not there not being enough time and with clocks and things like that. And Lisa Henson had a great quote where she said. After Paul died, um, Jim had rocket fuel in his blood, uh, which I think is a fantastic metaphor and really is true. I think it was, it, and you know, it's it's almost spooky that like Jim didn't have enough time ultimately. Um, but you know, there was something about about his brother dying young that Jim really felt he had to get it all done because there may not be enough time, and unfortunately, that came true. Yeah, yeah, that's my, that's one thing I always wonder about, like what he, what he would have done, you know. Um, now, especially just knowing he was so fascinated. Again, so many people just think think of him as a puppet guy, but he was so interested in film and and so fascinated technology. by technology. I think yeah. you know. I was talking to we uh, talking to Joe Hennis on um, uh, on a call before about it, and he says he said it, it, it's it, it's kind of pointless to even think about what Jim would have thought of what done with it because it would have been something that no one else would have thought of. Which I think, which I think is true, but I still think it's fun to think about because I think, I think he would have been so fascinated by cell phones and being able yeah. to film and and edit and and uh, distribute straight from your phone. I again, I, I have a theory. I think he would have been like one of the first people to to YouTube using YouTube as a show rather than how it was used for like the first ten years. Yeah, I mean, he's he's very much like George Lucas in the sense that he was all about, like, the democratization of the tech, the democratization of filmmaking, in the sense that, like, there's that great video you'll see of him where he's holding up the, like, the first handy cam, like the, when, and, and, and he's talking all about, he's like, you know, he's basically saying, anybody can make a movie. Like, to Jim, that was really exciting, that the tech you needed to make your own movie fit right in your hand. And the fact that now you could take all that tech to make and edit and add sound is right here in your hand. I think he would have absolutely loved that. Um, you know, he was, all, first of all, he loved gadgets anyway, but the fact that you've given everybody the power to express themselves creatively and make their own films and professional quality, I think he would have loved. But I, I agree with Joe in that if you say, what would Jim do? It's a tough game to play because, um, you know, that's what made Jim, Jim, is we don't know what he would do. And Jim, as I, was, as I said at one point in the book, like Jim had this knack to find solutions to problems that are hidden in plain sight. So he would have done something with the iPhone or with YouTube that we would have all gone like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Like it's something like we wouldn't have thought of. You're like, oh my God, of course. I mean, he always had the knack for doing that, uh, giving you the oh duh moment where you're like, I don't know why I didn't think of that. No, yeah. Well, was... well just right down to, I mean, the the original thing of him uh, just getting rid of the the puppet proscenium. And just being like the t at the TV is it? <laughs> like yeah. why why make a small <laughs> screen on a on what it was seems, you know back then a, such a small screen? 
Yeah. And it seemed, it's so weird because it seems so obvious to us, first of all, because that's the way we were all raised anyway. Right. But you're like, why wouldn't you do that? Mm. And then you see the old footage of Kukla Fran and Ollie, and you're like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Like they're behind the curtain, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, 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 but it's like it hadn't occurred to him. And then, of course, the other part of that equation is, oh, gee, you know, it's really hard to make sure like my head might be in the shot. I need to know what that looks like. Well, Jim's like, put the monitor on the floor. Just watch the monitor. I mean, again, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> it's like the solution's right there. Yeah, it's always it's, he'd pick a solution that's kind of like, yeah, you're right, just so obvious, but no one else was doing it. You know, that it makes me wonder about. Uh, I, I just posted a video the other day about like uh, a, a Muppet theory about about Kermit. Because oh, one yeah. thing that I that I, I wonder about is I don't know if you you, you didn't see it by any chance, did you? Mm -mm. Okay. The, um. The. Uh, you look at Kermit, and the shape of his pupil is so unique compared to all the other Muppets. And I was just so curious as to, like, where that came from, because it was on the very first Kermit. And he was just being resourceful yeah. with things around him, made the Kermit out of his mom's coat, used some ping pong balls for the eyes. It wasn't even a frog at first, because a lot of people think that the eye shape was inspired by frogs, but he wasn't a frog at first. Mm. He was an abstract character. I'm like, and again, just to see such a, a unique shape for a pupil, and then it's n never used again. And not only is it never used again, but he never ever really... It's never been tweaked, really. It, no, not, not even tweaked, oh. but never even explored different shapes for other characters. Like, why isn't animals yeah. like like small swirls or like a, a star... Gonzo's be like a starburst shape or something, right? He kind of ex yeah. did something different there. Do you, you don't happen to know anything about where that shape may have come from, do you? No, I don't. That is really interesting. And it's like, you know, like Miss Piggy's the only Muppet that's got irises. I mean, it's like it's like there's only two characters that look the way Kermit and Piggy do with eye wise. You're right. Yeah. And it is it is a weird into I mean, it's almost like Kermit had to become a frog because those eyes meant he couldn't be anything else, I guess. Yeah. Um, but you're right. It is, it's a non intuitive shape for an eye. And I don't know if maybe with, with the ping pong ball being cut in half, if it was warped or something, that was a way of holding it. I don't know. That's, yeah. a, that's a great, great observation, because you would think he might have just taken the ping pong Long and just drawn a black circle in the middle of it, and just made that like the googly eye. Again, and like like um, all the other characters, again, there's other frogs in this Muppet universe, and that's what they all have. Yeah. But uh, but in my in my very th in my theory video, which I'll link up here too for people too, uh, I my theory was that you know if if he's has all these craft supplies around him and some packaging around him that a lot of the type of packaging has this type of a, a shape on it. Uh, on these peg hooks, thinking that maybe he mm -hmm. took the packaging from his scissors or something or, and, and kind of traced it on because uh, it's hard to make things symmetrical like that. And um, Yeah, although if you, if you see the original Kermit in the Smithsonian, though, it's it's clearly not traced. You oh, can, like, sure. You can actually see yeah, you can still see the slash mark, but you're right; it could have been inspired. Sure. By yeah, that, that, that's thought. that's what I mean too. Not necessarily, not that it necessarily had to be traced, but even just looking at that shape, yeah. oh, like oh, that's an interesting shape. That's yeah. what artists do; they see shapes all around them. But that was one thing that I, I always kind of wonder. Yeah, like, that's yeah, a, it's so strange. That's a again, great... didn't really explore other things. I'll have to send you the video too. But another thing that yeah, I wonder great, about, great. because also uh, he's on record saying multiple things for it, is even just like the origin of the word Muppet. You know, because a lot of people um, originally said, apparently he's on record originally saying it's a combination of marionette and uh, and puppet. But then he's later on on record saying that it's just a goofy word. Yeah, I was, I was trying to see, did I actually find the marionette and puppet quote? I wasn't sure because even Jane was like, no, 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 no. It was never marionette and puppet. Yeah. Um, and she, and, you know, and she was there. She would have known. Um so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's you know, Jim did like the way words sounded. I mean, I, there's that great story about the grackle, you know, the bird yeah. grackle that becomes the grackle that becomes the frackle. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, my, my theory about it being derived from Moppet, Jane seemed to think had legs. Um, I think ultimately this is one of those that we as fans just have to continue to debate because I don't know that I really gave you the definitive word on it. Yeah. I mean, I gave you my strong opinion on it. I yeah. don't I don't believe it was marionette and puppet. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, I'm not convinced. I know that even it was derived from Moppet either. So yeah. I, I just I, do you I, mind I briefly oh. just describing uh, what uh, what the Moppet uh, idea is? Sure. So so Moppet is just an old term that means like ragdoll. Um, and it's, it tends to be like they, people tend to call little kids Moppets. Mm. And back in Jim's day, um, on 
the local NBC station, I think it was, back in the 50s, they used to show a TV show called um, Moppet Movies with Hoppity Skippity. It was like a daily kids TV show where they would show cartoons and little movies. So, and back on the wall, um, in paper letters, it even said Moppets mm. uh, in big letters on the back wall. So Jim, who was a TV junkie, I mean, I always liken it to um, when the first days of cable came out and you actually had the box that was like wired to a box on top of your TV. And I did this and you had like 20 buttons on this box and you would shotgun through every single channel, like watch everything you could because you might miss something. Um, Jim did that with TV and, you know, in the 50s and there were only three or, you know, three, maybe four channels if you were lucky. Um, and I think Jim watched everything that he could he could find. And so I'm I'm. I know he would have seen the Moppet movies mm, yeah. uh, on TV every single. So you know, it makes me wonder if that word Moppet was in his head yeah. um, when he got when he got ready to to name his you know his organization and his group. I mean, and even the word Muppet um, at that time, calling themselves the Muppets, didn't even necessarily mean the puppet itself. I think that like even he considered himself a a member of the Muppets at that point. Mm. I think that was sort of their, their true name. Like Frank Oz at one point called them a crazy little band called the Muppets. You know, I think they were like the Trogs, you know, something yeah. like that. Mm. It, was, it wasn't necessarily even the puppet. It was them as a as a as a gang. Oh, thing. interesting. Huh. I, didn't, I, love I didn't know that aspect of it. Yeah, because I, I always, I always, I had a couple theories too, and some of them I, I thought more than others. You know, knowing that he kind of created uh, getting rid of the proscenium and just using the camera, I thought, I thought maybe it was like like a movie puppet, like for film type of thing. And uh, but but another one I thought of too, just especially just uh, starting your book again. You know, him being so fascinated by the magic of Disney, and and you talk about magic uh, that he's fascinated with a lot in the book, and thinking of, it's almost like a magic puppet because it's just in the screen. It's just so alive in a way that puppetry, the puppets never seemed so alive like the way that a Muppet was, like the puppets before it. Yeah, could, yeah, it could be. Like I said, it's 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 the parlor game we as fans love to <laughs> yeah. We Adam and I joke though too because like so often, I mean, and we're. I mean, we're, we're nowhere in terms of celebrity or, or anything like that. But, you know, we've gotten like, you know, some news coverage over the years and stuff. And you get asked the same questions. And at a certain point, you just kind of want to, like, yeah. give a different answer. So we kind of joke, too, <laughs> when we've had this conversation yeah. and gone back and forth on it of like, maybe he was just screwing with people. <laughs> like, oh, I need yeah, a, I need yeah. something that sounds good, so I'll say this oh, or yeah, I'll that say that. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. I've, I've seen, I've seen a, an interview of, on Harry Potter, the the twin brothers. Oh, yeah. They did an interview. They were saying, like, oh, so so you guys look so alike. Like, oh, I know. That's why they casted us. Like, like you guys aren't related. Like, no, we're not related <laughs> yeah. at all. I'm seeing, oh, God, oh, they yeah. were just totally messing with the, um, with the interview. And also, too, like, sometimes when you're being interviewed by someone, you're like, you're very on the spot. And especially if someone suggests something, like, oh, maybe – Maybe someone asks, "Oh, is that a combination of marionettes and puppets?" You might just say, "Oh, yeah, yeah, that's." And then, sure. and then, yeah, then exactly. in a future interview, you look back at that. Oh, I, I said that. I guess I'm going to stick with that for now too, right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean, again, there's a lot of pressure in being interviewed and asked questions and people wanting answers that maybe there aren't answers to, right? Yeah. But uh, but that's yeah, again, that's what makes it fun theory and fun conversation for. Uh, yeah, us and, and even Jim at one point, and even Jim, even Jim at one point was like, "Well, we we've never we don't really do marionettes, you know." <laughs> Like, why would we use that word? But, um, but yeah, somebody did point out there, like, well, Muppets with like rods are kind of reverse marionettes. It's like, eh, come no, on, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no. Come on. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And then, of course, one of the other big myths I wanted to bust with that book was the, you know, the situation surrounding his death. Um, mm. Because there was a lot. And again, having been, you know, around in 1990 when he died, I was, you know, 22, I think, when he died. Um, you know, I remember the, 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 the rumors about it, like people were saying, oh, he had AIDS and, you know, he, he you know, there were all these just terrible rumors about him, including the one that, well, he didn't go see a doctor because he was, he was Christian science. And the, the, the phrase I kept hearing was refused medical treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course that, that wasn't true. Um, and in fact, you know, Jim working on films and things like that would have had to have seen a doctor to be insured for his film. So it's not like he, you know, hated doctors. The Christian Science enters into boy. I was, I was just watching the Muppets in uh, in his own words, the Jim Henson doc, and they really make they really make hay with uh, the Christian Science thing, and I I think their position on it is incorrect. Um, but you know, I mean, he was raised Christian Science, um, got out of the church in the in the early seventies, I think. Even there's there's even a document in the archives, I believe, that where they kind of say, okay, see you later. 
Um, but you know, it, it, it shaped his view a little bit, especially as a child. Um, and Jim, Jim didn't like to, you know, necessarily over, you know, try to take a lot of medication. As I said in the book, if he was sick, he was, he would take Tylenol and he would go to bed and things like that. He wasn't, you know, drug induced. He wasn't even doctor averse. The main thing about Jim, especially at that time when he dies is, um, you know, it, it's so hard to explain to people on this stuff. It's kind of what guys do. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Jim, Jim was a dude. Yeah. Um, when I was researching the book, I was in London in 2009 and I got swine flu when I was in London, really bad. Um, like my wife was there for a conference and I stayed in our room flat on my back for like three days and thought I was going to die. And do you know what I did? Nothing. Uh, Cause I was like, you know what? It's not serious. I'll, I'll get over it. I'll be fine. And I really think, and, and I did. Um, and I really think that's the way Jim was. I really think he just thought, you know what? It's, it's just, it's the flu. It's a bad cold. Uh, I'll be fine. Um, and then by the time he realized how sick he was, it was too, it was too late. Yeah. So, so, you know, I don't think Jim was, was waving off the doctors and was like, no, 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 my religion won't let me go to the hospital. Uh, I don't think any of that was, was true. Um, I think it was just mostly, he just did not realize how sick he is because again, that's kind of the way guys are. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that, yeah. I, I see that too. And also just like, I, I, I relate to that a lot myself too. So I, sometimes I'm, if I'm sick, I have a fever. My wife's like, Oh, let's go to the doctor. I'm like, I'm going to go to the doctor and and they're going to say, yep, you're sick. <laughs> yep. get, get some rest. Drink a lot of fluids. I'm like, you, you just kind of, a lot of time, a lot of that kind of stuff, you do just have to wait it out. But, yeah, there is a certain yeah. point um, that, uh, yeah, you do have to, uh, you know, definitely see a doctor and get things looked at. Especially well, and when you, and when you, yeah, yeah, when you read his medical charts and he's, and he's self-reporting, I mean, there was that moment when he was visiting his 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 parents in North Carolina. And he said later that he had coughed blood. Yeah. Um, that's the moment there. And you're like, Jim should have yeah. gone right then. Yes. Um, you know, and Michael Eisner, you, you see the interviews with Michael Eisner. And he's like, Oh, one shot. And he would have been fine. Um, that's not necessarily true because sometimes with what Jim had, um, by the time the symptoms are really showing up, you're, you're already too far gone. I mean, he had just that horrible bacterial infection that ate his, ate his internal organs. Um, so maybe by the time he even noticed that he was had bleeding in his lungs, his lungs could have been gone. Uh, it is one of those things that, you know, there are times when you're reading about him in his, in his apartment with Jane, you're like, dude, go to the hospital. Yeah. Um, but you know, but again, he's telling Jane, no, uh, I'm, I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to lay here. You just rub my back. I mean, you, he really, I don't think realized that he was fatally, because I think had he known he was fatally ill, he would have gone to a doctor. Let's yeah. not be ridiculous here. Yeah. So I, you know, I just think he just didn't realize how sick he was. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, definitely. You know, and well, people tell me that they, you know, that they, they love that chapter, even with as sad as it is. Um, and part of the reason that that chapter is so hard hitting, you can thank the Hensons. Because um, when I got ready to write that chapter, I said, I would like his medical records. And they gave them to me. Um, and my wife, who can read medical charts, um, went through and took very careful detailed notes and a timeline for me. So, um, so I knew exactly what was going on when and what the response from the doctors was and things like that. I still remember um, my office was in our basement. This is when we lived in Maryland. And my wife came down the stairs just like bawling uh, and just saying, it's, it's awful. It's awful. So she just kept saying, it's awful and sat down with me and went through her notes. On what happened, but um, but the reason I've got that very sort of aggressive, um, you know, moment by moment call on what's going on with Jim. First of all, it's because I wanted to myth bust some of this, so you knew exactly what was going on with him. But also because the Hensons were very generous about giving me that information. That's, I mean, that's the kind of stuff nowadays that actually would be covered under HIPAA. Um, you know, they gave me that information. They gave me those charts. They let me. They let me go through his medical records. No, and I, I. Th- you see this in other cases where when someone, um, you know, dies sooner than you think their time should be, they kind of get mythologized in this way and, and the details get get lost and get mm-hmm. get get smoky. Um, so, yeah, to have that such an incredible detail and an incredible record, um, I, I know I as a fan appreciated it and um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening feel feel the same way. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other, the, the last thing I'll, I'll put in this too, is I was, I was 
Um, the other place you feel this real sense of loss is because I was able to get into, you know, Jim's records and his business records is just what we missed out by him not going to Disney and, you know, staying alive, first of all, but like what he had planned for Disney, it would have been so much fun. Um, it, you know, it would have been, uh, again, we can't imagine what he would have, I think he would have finally gotten the cheapest Muppet movie ever made, made, um, and, you know, what everybody else was saying to me as well is Jim had this ability to always walk away. And Jim may have let Disney lock him into a 15-year exclusive with his own production company and then walked away from the Muppets altogether and just said, I'm going to go off and, you know, do, you know, Labyrinth 3 or whatever, you know, Jarrett's Revenge or whatever. And, um, and you know, the Muppets are in fine hands. Disney's taking good care of them. And, you know, I've installed Frank Oz in, in charge of the Muppets now or whatever. I mean... There, there's a lot of what might have been in there. And it was really fascinating to me, even just some of those early sketches Michael Frith was doing for the Muppet rides and things that we just never got to see. Um, you know, that's, that's at the point where that part, we forget that park was still brand spanking new at that time. And they were ready, I think, for Jim to make that little corner, his playground. It would have been amazing. And it's really sad that, you know, kind of the Muppets have fizzled over there and they're not quite sure what to do with them in that park now. No, definitely. I mean, his his losses certainly feel not, not only I, I think not only his loss, but also the loss of it being run the way he was able to run things. I think that's a we were, as Adam said, we were just talking with the Tough Pigs guys and, um, you, you know, to not have that one central figure um, kind of guiding the ship. And now it's sort of disseminated into these different people pointing it and pulling it and, and different things It it lacks that that focus that Jim had, which was such an important part yeah. of it. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I think, I think the Disney company learned a lot about acquiring other companies from their failure to acquire the Henson company. I mean, even after Jim died, I mean, I think there's a reason that now when Disney acquires companies, they leave, you know, Kathleen Kennedy in place at Lucasfilm and they leave Kevin Feige and, you know, other various folks in charge at Marvel. You know, they keep they keep the company sort of intact with people who know they're uh, there inside the company. I, I think they learned that lesson from having not done that with the Henson company. Um, you know, I think they were trying to sort of just like subsume the Henson company and, you know, acquire the intellectual property. And, you know, the, the biggest sticking point was Jim was like, I want my own independent production company here. Like they were squabbling over all that stuff. I really think they took those lessons they learned on how not to do it uh, with the Henson company and made them work when they went out later and started acquiring these other sort of iconic companies. I think, I think the reason Marvel in particular is like doing so well and like, you know, and their IP is really strong and they're creatively intact I think I think the way they structured Marvel in particular, and, and Lucasfilm to a certain extent as well, um, I think they really learned that from ha what they did not do right when they were going after the Henson Company, trading one MCU for another MCU. <laughs> oh, jeez, <yeah. laughs> right. no, that's right. That's really interesting. One thing I always think about about that too, because one thing that just also made the Muppets and, and everything that Jim did so unique is how he was the center of like, again, not only the company, but also like the lead in the show too. Like, I wonder like, I got, you know, you say like a Kevin Feige and, uh, and, um, and, and have it like uh, Kathleen Kennedy in front of, in, in the star Wars, right? Yeah. Kevin yeah. Kennedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, like what if it was, what if they just put like Matt Vogel in charge of like the Muppets at Disney and he's also the performer for it in the same yeah. way, kind of like, like Jim was again, maybe Matt Vogel doesn't even want that responsibility. <laughs> so I'm not necessarily saying that's what should happen now, but like maybe that's part of the piece that's missing now is just having Kermit, the character, and whoever it is, like a bigger part of just the whole, I don't know, what enterprise. Is it? Yeah. Enterprise. Of, yeah. The whole, the whole thing, the whole company. Yeah. Somewhere. No, I, no I, I get where you're coming from. I don't know who the right person is for that, but I mean, yeah. I, th I think you can see them struggling with that even in Jim's time because, you know, Jim really wanted to make sure whatever the Disney deal looked like that the puppeteers went in the deal, not just the puppets. Yeah. You know, Jim, Jim, Jim kept saying, you, you, can't take, you can't take Gonzo and put him on the arm of a 19 year old college student and have them walking around in the park. That's, that's not what Muppet performance is. Right. Um, like he, he, just, he just couldn't make them understand that like, you know, it's like, well, we, you know, we, we hired this particular actor and they're gonna do what we want. 
when you get the Muppets, if, if you don't bring the puppeteers with you, you've got, I think the, I think the metaphor Frank Oz used was it's, it's just a toy box at that point. Um, you know, you've got the toy box full of the puppets, but without the puppeteers, you don't actually own the Muppets in a sense. And so it was really important to Jim to like look out for those performers. And he was really trying to, and, and got very, very frustrated in particular with, um, oh God, not Ovid, um, Katzenberg, Katzenberg, because he didn't think Katzenberg got it. Um, like he, he didn't think Katzenberg understood it all. And that was when Bernie Brillstein kept saying, just, just cool your jets and go talk to Eisner. Eisner gets it. Um, but Katzenberg, you know, he really thought Katzenberg didn't understand it. And I mean, the, the irony is that after Jim passed, they did a lot of projects with Katzenberg, but, um, but Katzenberg didn't really get it. He, he wanted the IP and didn't understand that that IP was comprised of people. So I think to your point, Adam, what you really need somebody running them up, it's this understands the creative side of the Muppets it doesn't just look them as an as as an IP. Um, it's not like you've hired an acting troupe. You didn't bring in Monty Python's Flying Circus. I mean, it's like you you you've got a you've got something that's that's a one off in a sense because you don't you know you've got the puppets, but you've got to have those puppeteers. And puppeteer, as you guys know, puppeteering takes a long time to learn. And that was one of the things Jim wanted to be sure happened in the deal as well. He said, you know what, you guys own the Muppets. Got it. I still want to be there training picking, hiring the performers. Um, like he really knew that the way the Muppets lived in perpetuity was not just housing them with Disney, but taking great care of those performers. And I really think that may be a piece that even Disney currently still doesn't quite get. Um, because look at, for example, what happened with um, the most recent Muppets, the 2015 TV show, the one that's kind of like The Office. Um, I've talked about this before in a lot of other places. I think had they given that show time, it might have started to write itself. But look towards the tail end of that season. When you're letting Bill Beretta cut loose, God damn, that guy's funny. Yes. I mean, and that's when that show started. That's when that show's starting to kind of come together. Mm -hmm. um, because you're letting those people who do what they do really well go do it. Um, and so I, so I really think that like you need somebody like a Bill Beretta or somebody in there who like understands the business side of the Muppets, but also understands the business side of the Muppets is about the people in the Muppets as well as the, as just the it's not just an IP. If, if, if you're an item in a ledger, you're, you've got a big problem. That was the problem Jim had with Holmes Accords. Holmes Accords saw Dark Crystal as just an item in a ledger. And he was trying to like, you know, balance it out on the balance sheets. And Jim's like, this is art, man. You know, and he went and got it back. So I so I think that's one of the big I think that's one of the issues you've got to break open with Disney. Mm, yeah, that's interesting too, and it's interesting that you're talking about like with Bill Beretta too, because he also has like a lot of newer characters too, or which are ones that have popped like Pepe and and Bobo and things like that too. It almost makes you wonder if almost as much as I love the legacy characters, you love you don't want to see them go, but like maybe maybe it should almost be like like other TV shows. You think of like. Um, I don't know, like ER, like the cast of ER now is completely different cast yeah. than what it initially was. Like maybe whoever the puppeteers are, the Muppets should be characters, like their own characters in a way. Again, now I see like yeah. in a way that defeats the purpose of buying that IP in a way because you already have a, wa a warehouse full of Kermit backpacks and stuff. And we love those characters, right? Yeah. So it's just, yeah, it is so yeah. interesting to think about. Yeah, I mean, there really is There's so many different ways it could be done and different things that could work and yeah, just so yeah. I, we, yeah, I, but I mean, look at even some of the, some of the characters Disney acquired, look at what the, you know, look at what they did with uncle deadly, for example, yes. like Matt will turn yes. that character into like, into like a fashion maven and was like, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, I mean, that's a, what they did with that character was hilarious. I think it's like, you're finding, you know, it's, it's found objects again with them. You're finding some of these characters they already own and turning them into something new that like people embraced. People love Pepe. People yeah. loved that la that latest version of, of, uh, you know, of, of, uh, oh my God, I've already forgotten his name <laughs> of uncle deadly. I mean, it's like, I, I, I think there's still plenty to play with even on some of their back ventures. It's just yeah. a matter of finding the right people. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. 100%. Wow. Well, Brian, this has been, uh, you know, such a wonderful conversation. We appreciate your time. Um, and before we get into our final question, we'd just love to know if there was anything um, that you were hoping to be able to talk about today that through our questions we weren't it, it, that you weren't able to bring up. Um, no, I just I, I pulled a couple of little fun things. I thought just to like I showed you the letter from uh, from you know Francis Dion because again I see that I see that one show up on Twitter every once in a while. Though Muppet history loves that story, uh, so I thought I'd show you that one. Um, I do have I pulled this. This is from August 6, nineteen seventy nine. 
This is Frank Oz's original notes for Sam the Eagle, um, a, a background. I mean, we know Sam existed before this. He was in he was in Sex and Violence, but I love these because this is this is what part of what makes Frank Oz so great and so funny. Um, Frank Oz has the ability Frank for Frank and and Jim to a certain extent, but like for Frank in particular, like the character really matters. Uh, Frank always wanted to know the backstory, the history of all of his characters. You've heard him talk about Miss Piggy, how like, you know, she, her mother, her, her, her father was killed in a tragic tractor accident. Like he has these really great stories. Um, and, and what that does is it lets, it gives, it gives, it gets Oz into the mindset of that character. So no matter what anybody throws at him, I think this is one of the reasons he's such a great improviser, no matter what anybody throws at him, he can respond in character automatically because he knows that character so well. Um, this is a little bit of what he wrote about Sam, and I just think this is, this is so great. Um, this is the second paragraph. He and his wife have separated. She flew the coop, so to speak. He can't understand what happened. He felt very comfortable at home with his wife waiting on him, getting his newspaper, keeping the home clean, catering to his every whim. It's true he is not very capable of showing affection, but he thought his wife never seemed to need it. Sam has two children who never call him. He gets an occasional postcard. They are both in college. His son is studying to be a taxidermist. Sam doesn't understand that. Sam's told that he's cutting, Sam has told his son he is cutting his own throat. And Sam's daughter is dating Shudder and Owl. So I just, I love the thought that, that Frank puts into that, that sort of thing. Um, Dave Goles tried it a little bit with one of his characters, didn't really uh, get that into it. Richard Hunt thought that was ridiculous, that nobody yeah. needed to do anything like that. Um, <laughs> but, Frank, I, but I just love the thought. I mean, this is a memo from Frank to Jim, Jerry Jewell, David O'Dell, David Laser. <laughs> He's like ceasing the world on this to get that character down. Dated L Street, August 6, 1979. I love that. It's like it's like a puppetry version of method acting with Frank. It really is. <laughs> and, and again, it's like at any time, Oz is ready. He knows. And I love this note at the end here, and you'll you'll get this reference. As for what is funny, Tit Willow has been the best use of Sam. I'll try when I have time to think of other funny stuff for him. Wow. And there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And then the last um, item, the last item I'll show oh, yeah. you. Maybe you've seen me talk about this elsewhere. Um, this is so. This is a copy. You've probably seen me talk about this one. This is a copy of Jim Henson's passport. It's not the real thing. This is a passport. I always say, if Karen Falk's watching, this is not the real thing. It's a color photocopy. Uh, it's dated uh, January second, nineteen seventy six. Why I love this. So when I um, was interviewing people about Jim, I always asked a, a lot of sort of random questions because random questions can often get you very interesting um, insights into your subject. So one of the questions I would ask, for example, is what did Jim like to eat? When you went out to eat, what did Jim order? And people would say to a person, uh, I don't remember what he ate, but I know we had dessert, which mm. I think is very revealing. Jim Henson always wants dessert. Uh, Jim was all about the dessert. So I, I thought that was great. I thought that was a very good insight into the kind of person he was. But the other question I would always ask is, how tall was he? Tell me how tall you think he is. And everyone would say, oh, God, 6'4", uh, I'm guessing, 6'4", maybe 6'5". Uh, Frank Oz, who was Jim's literal right-hand man for a long time, you know, is, is Bert to his Ernie and, and Fozzie and Piggy to his Kermit. Anyway, Oz says, well, I'm 6'2". Uh, and Jim's taller than me, so I guess six four, six five. I don't know if you can see that. You see it there, six one. That's Jim's reported height, six foot one. Everyone say when I would I would show them this, they would say that can't be right. He seemed so much taller, which again is amazing insight into Jim Henson and the way he was. Everyone thought he was larger than life. Yeah. Everyone thought he was clearly bigger than he was because just the way he was, the way he carried himself, the way he was in charge, the way he ran a set, the way he charmed everybody, the way everyone wanted them, wanted Jim to like them. Um, I just, I love, I love that example here because I, I think it's very revealing for the way people saw him. Uh, and, and I just, I love, I love moments like that, but I, I've got this, you know, this is his 1976 passport. I also have a copy of his 1958 passport in which he also reports his height as six foot one. So Jim is not exaggerating. That's so I love funny. that. Oh, oh my gosh, goodness. That's great. Well, uh, the last question we, we always ask people is, um, it, uh, you know, you could kind of dealer's choice, take this ha as how you would like to, but we always ask puppeteers if they have a good story of a time where something didn't go right 
in the moment of performance or, or creating their art where they wanted to pull their hair out, but now they have a good good laugh about it, shed a good puppeteer. Um, didn't know if you had um, something uh, for yourself like that in, in the writing of any books or if you've just heard a good puppeteer story uh, from the set of The Muppets or, or Star Wars or anything like that that you wanted to share. Uh, I, to, to, for, to keep it to the Jim Henson story, um, this isn't that dramatic or sad, but I really struggled in the book with the narrative of the timeline of Dark Crystal. Um, not so much the planning of it and the filming things, but but as, as you guys, it, I mean, we're all, we're all in the same Henson family here, and you'll know what I'm talking about when I say we all kind of know that, like, the way Dark Crystal was received. There were issues with Dark Crystal when it first came out. It was confusing to people. And and we know that, you know, we know that Jim at one point envisioned it being done almost like an opera where there would be no English in it. And, and you know, they would all speak in their own made up languages. So there's a, there's a point where Jim has the film done to right before he releases it officially, where there's a lot of retrofitting going on. And that period right there was one of the was one of the points of the book that made me really crazy because I was trying to figure out what had happened where because to me this was a really important point because Dark Crystal was such an important project to Jim um, and where I don't want to say where it went off the rails but like you know Jim had to compromise what his initial vision was for it because things kept happening along the way so there's a Washington D.C. premiere at one point, and there was a premiere in Detroit. And there's a moment in, in his notes in the Red Book, which I've actually pulled. I, ha I haven't pulled that moment, but here's, here's my copy of Jim's Red Book, which is well thumbed. But there's one point in here where um, he debuts the Dark Crystal in front of an audience and actually writes in his Red Book, not good. Um, so I was trying to find like the moments where he determined to go back and start again and to like refill or not refill, but to like redub the sound into it. And so I was, I was sort of, to use the term I've used once before, I was sort of retrofitting a lot of the stories I'd heard. I talked to David O'Dell, who said he remembered going in with the, with the film, like, you know, in a, almost like a, almost like a, what do they call it? A film Ola or whatever, like running the film back and forth to figure out how many syllables were in a sentence. So oh, he could yeah. like write the write English something. language. Yep. So it would line up. So I had a lot of people talking about, so I was, and it sounds like such a minor thing, I understand. And, and I hope when you read the book, it looks like no big deal. Um, but I was going absolutely bonkers in that section there because I couldn't figure, I couldn't figure out what was going on when and when the debut was. And I was talking with Al Gotsman, his attorney about some of these things, you know, like going everywhere I could. When did Jim talk about this? You know, Michael Frith had a story. So I was really trying to, and, it, and again, it seems like such a minor point, but with the Dark Crystal, I really wanted to try to be sure I had that entire timeline and including the creative timeline, right. Um, I felt redeemed ultimately when um, my friend Cassine, uh Cassine Gaines, who wrote the Dark Crystal book that came out a couple of years ago, it's a beautiful book. Um, he apparently at one point had some questions about the timeline and Cheryl Henson said to him, go look it up in Brian's book because it's right. And I felt completely vindicated at that point that I had gotten it, that I had gotten it. And Cheryl is not one of these people that hands out compliments a lot, but I felt so great that Cheryl was like, go check there because I'm sure it's right. Um, but that was a moment that I, you know, that I went nuts and it seems very minor. Um, but when you're, you know, a biographer or historian, the timeline is what matters to you, huh? um, especially with somebody like Jim, where everything that he does, you know, it's funny, I have people say, uh, people talk about biographies that aren't written chron chronologically, like I'll see reviews of Jim Henson and be like, well, it's a chronological telling of Jim's story. And I'm like, I don't know how else you would tell Jim's story. Because everything Jim does is causal, meaning because he did this project and learned these lessons that then led to the next thing. Like you can't really, you can't view Jim's life and work non-linearly uh, in that regard. So, so that's why timelines, in, in, at least to me, will make you insane because you want to be absolutely sure you've got those timelines right because it influences the way you see another project down the road. So, uh, so that one made me really crazy. But again, I finally felt vindicated when they thought that I had gotten that one right. But uh, that's a very minor nerdy in the weed story, but it is a moment that I was going crazy in the narrative. No, that's I love that, and it's got a, a wonderful button to it too. So uh, that's yeah. that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's that's wonderful. And, and uh, just to our audience, uh, make sure that you check out this book. It's a it's a great read. And also, I know there's a lot of puppet builders uh, that listen to this. So I know th my first time going through it was through the audio book because it's great to listen while you're making puppets and stuff. And uh, and I'll tell you too, 
the guy who did the audio book is amazing. I love the way he did Kirby voices. Hayborn. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Kirby Hayborn. I love the way he did like voices for Jim and I, and he did the voices are amazing that he did it. It made it really a really fun listen. So uh, well, I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll tell you, I I I don't know if it's considered gauche to listen to your own audio book, but I did it. And uh, I remember I was driving between D.C. and Fredericksburg, Virginia, which in, in traffic can be like a five hour drive. It's only like 40 miles, but it's ridiculously long. So I was sitting listening to the audiobook while I was stuck in traffic. And when he does two moments, made me laugh when he does um, Lorne Michaels and he does like that Lorne Michaels sort of <laughs> like that part made me laugh out loud. And then when he did um, Terry Jones and he talked about drawings and I was like, this guy totally nailed that. I oh, just God. loved Kirby It Hayes. was so, so yeah, but yeah, that, those were really fun moments. But again, even just like do, do talking in a soft, like Henson, like kind of tone and, uh, and even yeah. do like a little Frank Oz stuff. Like, oh, it was, it was just really, it made it really, really, uh, it, it, yeah, it Kirby, made it extra, Kirby's, uh, extra amazing. Kirby's wonderful. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but definitely uh, check out uh, those books. And also, so where's the best way for people to follow uh, what's coming next for you? Uh, I am always running my mouth over on Twitter at Brian J. Jones. Just spell out my middle name, B-R-I-A-N-J-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S. That's also my website where I post uh, projects as they come up, which I don't have at the moment. But um, but the, the, the best, best place to find me in real time is probably on Twitter. And uh, if I get another project here, I'll let you know over there as well. But in the meantime, thank you everybody for reading. That book is still in print. You can get it any place you buy books. I don't care where you buy it. I get paid the same regardless. Um, so, uh, you know, support your local bookstore, order it online, uh, borrow it from the library, whatever you want to do. But thank you all so much, everyone, for uh, the support and the love for Jim and that book. Because like I said, it's, it's still out there. It's still in print. And I really appreciate it. Well, Brian J. Jones, thank you so much for, for joining us on Puppeteers. It was great to have you. Thank you, Jens. I appreciate it. Thanks, bud. Bye. We're at the end of another episode of Puppeteers, but the fun doesn't stop here. Visit puppeteers.com for show notes and links to projects mentioned in this episode. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at PuppeteersPod, where we're posting new things every day. Puppeteers is edited by Matt Bowen and made possible thanks to viewers like you. If you enjoy this content, you can join our incredible Patreon patrons who are supporting the show for as little as $1 per episode. Those folks get access to early releases, uncut episodes, official Cup O tiers just like we use on the show, and can even submit interview questions for our guests. Go to patreon.com slash puppeteerspod to learn more. Another great way to support Puppeteers is rating and reviewing us on iTunes, leaving a comment or subscribing to this channel, or tell a friend about your favorite episode. Thanks again for joining us on Puppeteers Puppetry Shop Talk, in-depth interviews with the world's most passionate puppeteers. Hosted by me, Adam Krutinger. And me, Cameron Garrity. I don't think you know anything about England, did you? I mean, you, you were in Hereford, weren't you, first of all? I think you left Hereford when you were about seven years old. No! Your research really sucks. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd be embarrassed if I were you. Okay. And if you remain callous and obdurate, I... What's obdurate? I don't know. Sir. <laughs> Shall perish as he did, and you will know why. Though I probably shall not exclaim as I die. This is the last one, Sam. Willow. Ted Willow. Ted Willow. <laughs> Why are they laughing? <laughs>